Well, good morning, everyone. As I can see, everyone is very smart and very casual this morning, which is wonderful. I hope you all enjoyed the conference start yesterday and the welcome reception as well. It was lovely to meet so many of you, some of you actually for the first time, and I really, really hope that I get to talk to more of you uh, over the next two days. Now, we have a very charged day ahead. There's no question about that. But before we begin with uh, another Davos-style session, uh, where we will consider the significance of private international law and international family law and child protection, let's talk social media. It behooves an event like this. I was told by people who are much, much younger than I am that it needs a presence on social media. And I'm in completely remiss that I haven't actually mentioned this yesterday. We have dedicated Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter channels. And if you're not following us yet, you really should do that. But I encourage you to take photos, happy snap, etc., selfies, and so on. Uh, just do this to your heart's content and post about this event and share it with your friends. Uh, and if you add the hashtag HCCH125, which is our hashtag for this year, then you will become part of our corporate memory. So save probably somewhere on the servers of Facebook, and who knows what is done with that by Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> there will be plenty of social media moments, I can tell you, not only in this venue, but also tonight during the Harbour Cruise. I have to say that there are two important issues that I should mention. The first one is, please wear your badge or attach yourself to someone who, bear, who wears the badge. Without badge, there will be no admission to the boat. Talking about admission to the boat, please make it by 5.45, the latest, to the bus terminal. Now, there will be plenty of students who will guide you. This is a military operation. I am still not 100% sure how it's going to happen, but it will, I'm sure, be in good hands with Edwin. But if you miss the 5.45 bus stop, uh, or the last bus at 5.45, you will swim to join us for the dinner. And uh, the delegate from Brazil already told me that he had his swimwear with him in case. The breakout sessions tomorrow, I also mention very briefly for the very simple reason that those of you who haven't registered for one, please do so. There are registration sheets just outside, and um, we need final numbers because of the room allocations and uh, the updates for that will also be available outside. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we're going now to our session number two. Uh, it will deal with international family law, as I just said, and we are on page 23 of our program, Progressing Perfectly. It is my great pleasure to introduce the moderator of this session, the Honorable Diana Bryant, AOQC, the former Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia, her profile is on page number 11, if you're interested, and I hand straight over to her um, to kick off proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Um, good morning to you all, and welcome to this morning's session. It's, um, I look around the room, and I see so many experts in this area. I think we're going to have an interesting session, and I urge you to participate. Um, the session is, of course, as yesterday's was, Davos style. When I first learned of the name of the style of the sessions being a keen skier, I thought there might be snow involved. <laughs> but alas, no. The panel consists of Anne-Marie Hutchinson, a partner at Dawson Cornwall, and a world-renowned family law solicitor specialising in international family law and international movement of children. Professor Nieve Rubaha, a private international law professor at the University of Buenos Aires, She's currently a member of the Experts Group on Recognition and Enforcement of Voluntary Cross-Border Agreements in International Child Disputes, and the Argentinian representative on the Experts Group on Parentage. The third member of the panel is Professor Cristina Gonzalez from the University of Barcelona. She too is a member of the Experts Group on Parentage and Family Agreements. She's very kindly stepped in at the last moment when our scheduled panel member Professor Lena Ganich, Dean of the Faculty of Law and Political Science at the St. Joseph University in Beirut, was unable to obtain a visa at the last moment. And we're very grateful to um, Professor Gonzalez for her assistance. Professor um, Ganich wishes to express her disappointment at being unable to be here. She's provided me with her notes, and I'll read them out 
later after the others have finished, because I think they provide an additional perspective to our discussion this morning. I, um, I'm at, at the moment, I'm judge in residence at Melbourne Law School, and I have the opportunity to attend lectures, and so I've taken the opportunity to attend some master's intensives in international, public international law, which has been very interesting. One of the things that's emerged from the discussion um, in our classes is that in public international law at the moment, the, um, there's a, somewhat of a, a depression amongst the scholars. Um, Post-World War II years were seen as the zenith of international cooperation and instruments in public international law. But as we know from what we see in international affairs at the moment, the public international law is a concern that we are seeing uh, a diminution in the desire to cooperate uh, amongst nations. That, I think, contrasts completely with the Hague Conference, because I think what we see in the Hague Conference is quite the reverse, a desire to, to cooperate uh, uh, across all of the countries. And I think one of the, one of the things that exemplifies that are the number of countries that have signed the, adop the um, abduction convention, for example. So I think it's, we are in a very different space, and I think a much happier one. This session is about the Hague Conference's role to facilitate the protection of human rights in the area of international family law and child protection. It's in this area in particular that the importance of the underlying philosophy of the Hague Conference, as described by Chief Justice Ma yesterday, resonates. That is, a sound system of laws fosters peace and prosperity. And in what area could that be more important than the area of protecting children? And it's in this area that, as speakers mentioned yesterday, the Child Abduction Convention stands as a shining success, not least of which is the number of member states that have acceded to the convention. It's also spawned the very successful Hague Network of Judges, a cooperative and practical means of making a convention work, which Professor Fentiman described as, yesterday as a bottom-up approach. But even successes come under pressure as social mores and family structures change and evolve. Technological advances, as we heard yesterday, require consideration of how the international community can deal with surrogacy and parentage issues. The panel will discuss these issues and look at what pressures are emerging and how they might be addressed in the years to come. The abduction convention is only 38 years old, and so we won't try to forecast beyond another 40 years. The, um, the Hague Conference, I think, the success of the Hague Conference has meant that there's a great desire to see international conventions working well. And as Professor Fentiman described it yesterday, it's utopian aspirations, it seems at least in great part, is achievable. Uh, I now hand over to um, Pr Professor Nueve Bancha. Hello, good morning to everyone. Uh, I am, at the first place, I am very honored to be here. I am really expecting this moment, and I am now in Hong Kong for the first time, so this is good for me also. So, well, in these few minutes, what I would like to introduce is the Latin American imprint in global solutions, particularly, of course, in this field, in this subject matter of this panel, which is the family international issues. So. Sorry. So, I cannot go forward. Okay. So, thinking in family international law in Latin America imposes a focus on human rights, but not in an abstract way, because the economic, social, political, and the reality of the regions also impacts in this human rights imprint. So, from this focal point, I would like to, po to point out this one, no, but it's not there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. 
Don't matter. Doesn't matter. So, I'm sorry. From this focal point, I would like to point out two aspects. On the one hand, Important work has been done in the region in order to fulfill human rights. But there are still challenges pending in order to optimize existing solutions. And on the other hand, the question of private international law. Are the new solutions needed for new or for unsolved problems? So, in order to appreciate the imprint of human rights in the region, some distinctive features are worth mentioning. I will mention four of them. On the first place, the fact that the, that the region was populated originally by immigrants, and in the last decades, reality imposed the need that people go to live abroad or to other countries or to migrate again. In the second place, the impact of military governments are what they have triggered in the region in the field of human rights. For example, regarding, especially, especially in Argentina, uh, the right of rec to recognition of the identity, which is a consequence of the removal of children for, from their families and from their parents during these periods and the substitution of their identities, will also impact in the understanding of the right to have access to one's origins. In the third place, the strength and the importance of international instruments, especially the UN Convention of the Rights of the Children, which brought a reformulation of national constitutions as well as a domestic laws. And in the fourth place, the doctrine of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, especially taking into account the peculiarities of the system which differs from the European one. For example, among these main differences, it should be mentioned the capability of the Inter-American Court not only to condemn countries for the violation of human rights, but also to impose obligations, obligations in general cases or in, in particular cases, for example, the training of judges on human rights or the improvement of legislation, which impacts not only for the case in which the courts intervene, but also this doctrine have effects in other countries. So, in addition, the changing scenarios for families and the latest developments of science also mean that the imprint of human rights is not a static question. On the contrary, it is dynamic. So this dynamism also impacts in the human rights imprint. So to answer the first question, two different but complementary aspects should be considered. On the one hand, what has been done in the region in order to fulfill human rights? It is remarkable, nationally and at the international scope. Especially, it is remarkable the work developed by the HEP Conference of Private International Law and also the CDIP, what the CDIP has done in the region. But on the other hand, it should be recognized that there are still challenges pending in order to find real solutions for real cases. For example, if we think on maintenance, which probably is the, the, the area in which we have more, more of the cases. In Latin America, only two countries are parties to 2007 Hague Convention, Brazil and Honduras. If we think in 1980 Convention, despite its great ratification in the region, there are still challenges pending in order to reach the proper implementation of this convention, mainly, mainly regarding the procedural aspects. While some states have already made uh, progress in reducing delays, for example, some other states are still working on that. So if you see, for example, the conclusions and recommendation of the last uh, special commission, you will find the detail of countries who has improved in this regard and wh what other countries need to, to improve this, this issue. Also, the 1996 Hague Convention has only five countries that are party to it in the region. So, in order to increase the ratification status of existing conventions, it will be needed a work on the dissemination of these conventions, on a, a deep analysis by the countries of these conventions, and a, a uh, to see the, the, the challenges for each country to enter to these conventions and the pros of being parties of them. So, 
Because of this, it is necessary to assume that a lot has been done in the, in the region in order to fulfill human rights. But there is a lot of work to do in order to reach effective solutions and effectiveness of human rights. And probably the synergy between academia, authorities, and the rest of the actors of the region in this field could, could help in this task, as well as probably technology could help also in this task. So, for the last point, two questions are posed. First, which are the current new problems in this field that put human rights in jeopardy? And on the second place, how could private international law could contribute to face them and to enhance the effectiveness of human rights involved? So, some su subject matters that could be mentioned are parentage, recognition and enforcement of voluntary agreements, which are already in the Hague Conference agenda. But we can also mention migration, gender issues, trafficking of children, cohabitation outside marriage, homosexual, homosexual couples or unions. So in order to face these problems, some aspects should be considered. Firstly, because of lack of shared basis in such sensitive areas, there is often difficulties to find unified solutions. However, there are some resources which could be profitable for the achievement of these tasks. Both creativity and experience have been of a paramount importance in the work developed by the Hague Conference, so this should be a guideline to follow, I think. Plurality of private international methods and approaches could be profitable to reach these tasks. And of course, international cooperation, which has become a keystone in this area. But we have to mention also the strength of public, public policy, because it constitutes a barrier for unified solutions in these sensitive areas. So in this regard, some questions arise. Should human rights in general and the best interest of the child in particular help to attenuate it? Should the extent of public policy be reduced in order to fulfill fundamental rights? Does the fact that national and international courts follow this avenue mean or imply that legislation has to do so? So to answer these questions, and in order to appreciate the best interest of the child, it would be useful to reach consensus about the extent of the, of, of the best interest of the child in each, in each context, and to find shared perspective for each of the before mentioned areas. Otherwise, trying to unify the concept of best interest of, of the child in a general way probably would lead countries to keep attached to their own definitions, and this definitely would block any possible solution, and the public policy would block any public, uh, possible solutions. In addition, the length of the procedure to conclude, approve, and adopt international instruments should be taken into account. So in this context, experience in other fields could be useful to appreciate the acceptance of new realities that were unthinkable in years ago. For example, the homosexual marriages or partners in some countries. So, lastly, the participation of Latin American countries is desirable and needed in all the procedure, on all the process of the development of global solutions. So, they, that they will include the Latin American imprint and hence the countries of the region will feel encouraged to be part of them. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good morning. Um, and again, I'm delighted to be, uh, have been asked to contribute to this session. Um, I thought we might remind ourselves of the preamble to the UNCRC. Um, and forgive me if I read that to you. And the preamble says, convinced that the family as the fundamental group of society and the natural environment for the growth and well-being of all its members, and particularly children, should be afforded the necessary protection and assistance so that it can fully assume its responsibilities within the community. 
and another part of the preamble, recognizing that the child, for the full and harmonious development of his or her personality, should grow up in a family environment and in an atmosphere of happiness, love, and understanding. So I just want to remind ourselves that the, for this session, the family as a unit, whatever that might be, and I think we might need a discussion as to what constitutes the family, is the center. The child is part of it, but that's our focus. And I just wanted to look at some general themes, if you'll forgive me, um, and in there are no particular order. So firstly, I think we've got to remind ourselves that the work of the Hague Conference in ensuring the in, um, effective implementation of our existing conventions has to be supported and continued. Because if our existing conventions do not work or um, become um, otios, then new member states are not going to join and new member states are not going to buy into the process. Um, so we just need to remind ourselves of that and support the soft law developments, best practice, judicial training, practitioner training, certainly from my perspective. And I've recently returned from the Russian Federation, which is a huge, huge jurisdiction, um, massive. You know, an eight-hour internal flight to go from Moscow to where we were um, doing some judicial training. And that country is such that new member states of the 1980-96, they need help. I mean, we can't expect new states just to assume all of the jurisprudence we've adapted over many years. Um, because PIL, well, what it must provide for families is certainty and reasonable, fulfilled expectations. And if there is no certainty for families, we are not, we are not fulfilling um, what I see the purpose of the Hague Conference is. And the next session is, is um, international, commercial, and financial law. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, well, that is so linked to the family. The family is so essential to commercial and financial law. Um, in the UK, I don't know if anybody had, we used to have a TV program in the 70s, or maybe it was the 80s, called Alf Wiedersehen Pet. And it was about um, British workers in those days, because it was a recession, who were going off to Germany to work on the lump, as we used to call it, so the breadwinner would go out and send their earnings home to the family, um, the fruits of their labor. But those days have gone. Um, and in the UK, as we face Brexit, um, we, discussions about, oh, well, we'll give visas to our workers, etc. They don't want that. People don't want that anymore, economic migrants. They want to live with their families. They want to move to work with their families to educate their children, their children to be looked after. And that's what um, the Hague Conference is dealing with, is international families who lawfully move um, and who are bringing up children within their, that core. And that's what our conventions must do to support them, to provide certainty. So if they move, they know that their rights of custody, if they move from Poland to the UK, are upheld and sustained or um, transposed, their rights of inheritance, etc. And these are essential core values that without that certainty that's provided by um, the 1980 convention, but particularly the 96 convention, um, families are not um, going to feel able to... Um, Sustain, you know, to sustain those moves, and that will have an impact on our commercial and financial law. So they, we, they're not, not connected, they are interconnected and they're codependent. Um, and as I mentioned, Brexit, we can't avoid it, it seems to me, as I come from the UK, although I'm Irish, so I'm okay, my passport's okay. Um, but that for the UK will mean that we have to look back to the Hague Conventions and particularly the 96. Um, but equally, the, remain, you know, the EU 27 will have to look to that convention in order to deal with the UK. So I would hope if one thing comes out of Brexit, because not a lot else will, the um, 96 jurisprudence, I think, we will develop it because we will have to. And that will benefit the other existing states, such as Australia. And hopefully then um, other states will join the 96 because it will become more important. Um, I would hope we will build up the jurisprudence. Um, just as a practitioner, um, challenges, we must make access to you, the conventions available. And by that, I mean whether it's provision of legal aid or representation. Um, but if it, conventions are going to be effective when they are needed, 
there must be access to legal advice and the ability to get before whether it's a court or the administrative authority in order to um, apply those rights and to, to access the, right, the child's rights under the conventions. Um, it's been said that the most, one of the most successful conventions is the 1980 Convention Child Abduction, which I think it is, um, but that has changed the convention and the, its use has changed. And one aspect, certainly for, from the UK perspective, and I think that's growing, is the child has become more at the center. And the, fo it's all, the focus has always been about the child, but we must look at meaningful recognition and representation of the child's best interests within conven that convention when it's applied. And whether that's separate representation of children or ensuring that the child's um, voice is heard through some reporting officer, it depends on your country, but with, certainly with new states, we must assist them in ensuring that the child's voice um, is heard within any convent 1980 process, and equally the 1996. So, um, <coughs> opportunities in the future. I think really, if we're looking at new conventions, and I'm an, an observer on the parentage group, any new conventions must be capable of evolving, and they must be living conventions, so that as requirements change, so the, the convention is wide enough and drafted broad enough that it can it can adopt to them. So if we look at the 1980 convention, when it was <laughs> envisaged and in the early years, it was really dealing with kidnap, kidnap cases. But it doesn't, it's not now. The majority of cases under that convention are where a primary carer, be it mother, father, um, removes the child or retains the child. But the convention is capable and has been capable to deal with that massive change. Um, and it continues to do so. So the future, I've got, Four points. One, the Malta process must continue. We must, must, must um, continue to work with sh states that apply the Sharia, whether fully or in parallel or a parallel jurisdiction. It's a shame Lena's not here because she comes from the Lebanon. The Lebanon is such a jurisdiction that has a, so many applications of law. But we must continue the Malta process, it seems to me. Otherwise, the 1980 and the 96 convention are not going to... Um, <laughs> be as effective as they should be. The parentage group, that must continue, and we'll see where we will go with that. Um, children were the emphasis of this, but the Convention on the Protection of Adults, it seems to me, is going to come into its own in the next 50 years, um, simply because one of the biggest illnesses in the world is Alzheimer's and dementia. And certainly in the UK, the biggest area of growth in our court system is our court of protection. And our family law judges have to now have been assigned to sit in the Court of Protection to the extent that then our 1980 cases have been devolved down to deputy judges. I mean, they're still high court judges, but in order to deal with the amount of cases coming under the um, Court of Protection. So <clears throat> it seems to me the protection of adults will become hugely important. And you just, I, last year I had a case where, um, almost, we called it the granny abduction, but you know, an elderly woman who had dementia was some Sengali guy, and he took her off to South Africa, and her family were distraught in the UK. She had dementia, and to get her back was almost impossible. And I was like, if only, if only we had, the, you know, that convention had been applicable, it would have been a speedy, speedy process. Um, and my prediction in the next 50 years, I think it's gender reassignment will be an issue. It's an issue of status and... In the next 50 years, the Hague Conference is going to have to address that, whether it's by a convention or whether it's part of the parentage convention. But it seems to me that will be an issue um, that we will need to cover and, and look at so that people, gender, gender reassignment and status is, can be recognized internationally and people don't become non-people because they move state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Testing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, the first thing that I would like to say is that, of course, I'm delighted to be here. Although I have to say that yesterday I discovered that I would have to speak, which 
posed a bit of a problem because I was not thinking that I had to speak. And uh, I worried all day about what I was going to say in 10 minutes. And uh, in the end, I decided that I would take up three points that were raised by yesterday's speakers and just apply them to family law and give you a very personal uh, view um, based on um, also my participation in the uh, expert groups here at The Hague. Um, um, the first point that was raised was that actually in private international law, we should focus more on the values particular to each specific topic. And I really think that this is an issue in family law because um, uh, very often what happens is that because everybody has a family, everybody has thoughts about what a family should be. But very often our reflections on family law are not really very deep. Uh, because we have a family, it doesn't mean that we know how families function or how families should be protected or promoted. Um, and in connection to that, um, I would also like to say that I think that very often uh, the ideas that we have about families are normative ideas of an idealized kind of family that perhaps is not what is there in reality. So we have this idea that a family is two persons, a man and a woman, and two or three children. This is the nuclear family. Uh, which, by the way, didn't exist until the 19th century. It only appeared in the 19th century. And perhaps today, we are sometimes forcing this model on reality. For example, we think that uh, there, there are lots of divorces, but we conceptualize these divorces as a succession of nuclear families. One nuclear family replaces the other nuclear family. But if you look at it from the perspective of children, which is what we are required to do, in fact, you find a child that has a relationship with his father, with his mother, with the partner of the father, the partner of the mother, the children of the partner, the children of the former partner. Um, uh, I have a friend who is a school teacher, and she tells me that on the forms that families have to fill in, there is not enough space <laughs> to specify these things. Uh, this would be the first point, this post-marriage family, um, and sociologists like Ulrich Beck have extensively explored this. Uh, then another thing is, of course, parentage. And uh, by being a member of the parentage group, I discovered that in Canada you can actually have, I think, Marie, I'm looking at you, six parents or something like that, which, of course, is perhaps not known elsewhere, where we still have the idea that you only have two parents. Uh, um, and on top of this, in our very multicultural societies, we are uh, facing groups that live according to different standards and according to different values. Uh, now, um, what does this mean for private international law? Uh, I think that we would need to reflect on this. Probably um, uh, the point that was raised by Anne-Marie is very important. We need continuity. And I have to say that I think that the 1996 convention has some rules that are not very often remarked upon because they function outside the judiciary like the rule on conflit mobile, where you don't lose the parents you had, uh, the parental responsibility you had when you moved to another country and the applicable law changes. So these are, these are, this is a very important thing. And um, um, in continuity to that, I think that another point that was raised yesterday is also very important, this idea that we should perhaps um, 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 look at uh, family law, not only from the perspective of the state, and not only from the perspective of the judiciary. Um, we should think about um, families, uh, what families need. Um, um, I'm now copying, the copyright is Anne-Marie's, and marie talked about the unremarkable family. I mean the family that is not posing big dramatic 
problems that require intervention by the state, but the families that are just moving, the families that are um, entering into agreements. Uh, one of the things, because we have this complexity of so many different family structures, um, we are uh, more and more telling people that they should sort it out themselves. Uh, we are telling them, uh, please don't go to court. Or if you go to court, mutual consent, uh, mediation. Um, uh, uh, very often, um, um, in some countries like my own, we have introduced uh, divorce, an out-of-court divorce that has been introduced also in France and in Italy. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps we have to think about what we can do in order to support families when they move. Because uh, on the one hand, we're telling them, go to mediation, enter into agreements. But on the other hand, we know, and the practitioners have told us, that it is not so easy to guarantee that an agreement will actually uh, be recognized and enforced uh, outside uh, the jurisdiction where it was entered into. So I think that perhaps um, uh, the focus should not only be on the family at crisis, uh, at big crisis, but also on the normal family that is moving and that is um, 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 needing the support. Because there is one thing that uh, everybody is in agreement, which is that families are important. Uh, and that families should be supported. Also in the context of what was mentioned just a few minutes ago, um, families are uh, the care providers in our societies. Families are in charge of the dependents, the children and also the adults, the ill, the uh, persons that uh, need support. So um, I would think that uh, this would be something that the Hague conference should focus on. Um, and then uh, my last point would be um, there was some uh, discussion yesterday about access to justice. Um, and I have to say that here also things have changed a lot. Uh, when you um, um, look at private international law, how it was 125 years ago, it was the law of the rich, of those that went to Monaco and played in the casinos, the princesses that traveled around Europe. Uh, today, it is the law of lots of people that belong to very different groups. And of course, we, call, we talk about the family, but you can't compare a family belonging to the jet set with all possibilities of buying legal advice um, and it Private international law can be very complicated um, if a lawyer is trying to find his or her way through the jungle of international conventions, European regulations, or whatever. That is very difficult. And uh, if you want to hire a lawyer that is capable of doing that, you will have to pay. Uh, but most of the clients, or some of the clients, cannot afford. And some of the cases that uh, we see that are particularly difficult are in those groups. Um, I worked for a time with the General Counsel for the Judiciary in Spain, and um, I was requested advice on a particularly difficult case of a Pakistani woman that had moved to Poland and that wanted to divorce her Pakistani husband that was in Spain. So, um, and this woman didn't have any resources, so she was relying on legal aid, and what was she getting? She didn't get the proper advice. So it became a mess. Uh, um, um, and I think that this is something that we also have to deal with. Uh, we, we need to think that there is no such thing as their family, not only because families are very different, but also because the issue of class is probably as important as the issue of cultural origin. And that was it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you, Christina, especially for stepping in at the last minute. Um, I'm just going to read out um, uh, 
Professor Ganache's notes because I think they are they are interesting and you would like to hear them. Um, she was going to focus on child protection <clears throat> in the Middle East and North African, which she called MENA countries. The idea is to highlight the very sensitive relationships between MENA countries and the Hague Conference on Private International Law. Many of these countries, such as Lebanon, for instance, hesitate to join the Hague Conference, and some of them, who are already members of the conference, are still reluctant to sign the conventions related to family law. However, the conventions concerning the protection of children, um, both the one on child abduction or the one on parental responsibility, may change the picture, since they seem more compatible with other, than other ones with the legal system of MENA countries. In this regard, the signature of the Child Abduction Convention by Morocco and Tunisia as well as the signature of the Convention on Parental Responsibility by Morocco alone, may have introduced a true revolution within the private international law of MENA countries. That is because Hague Conventions convey important changes into legal systems, which are traditionally renowned for their great stability in the area of family law. Nobody knows today if other Arab countries are going to follow the example of Morocco and Tunisia. But for the first time in the recent history of the Arab legal systems, becomes possible to seriously consider new perspectives of cooperation between the MENA countries and the Hague Conference. Uh, she then raises two main points. First, she tries to explain why MENA countries are still reluctant to sign the Hague Conventions. And secondly, to highlight some changes in the MENA legal systems, especially in the field of fundamental rights of children, which may prov promote or facilitate a better cooperation with the Hague Conference in the years to come. So why do MENA countries tend to be suspicious towards the Hague Conventions on Child Protection? This attitude can be explained, she says, by the fact that family law is still closely tied to religion, even though in several MENA countries family law has been codified and can be considered, at least formally, as part of state law, its contents remain directly inspired by religious provisions. This has obvious consequences on the scope of application of family law since you can't deal with a religious law as you deal with a secular one. Religious law is the expression of God's will. It can't be stopped by any boundary. It follows you wherever you go. You can't exchange it against any foreign law. There is no, and therefore cannot be, equality between religious law and foreign law. Therefore, the whole methodology of bilateralism is generally inapplicable in mean legal systems. This is not only due to the lack of equality between foreign law and religious law, but also to the fact that legal systems which are closely linked to religion cannot be indifferent to substantive results. They have to ensure that the result which is achieved by the applicable law to a family case involving one of their nationals is, combat is compatible with religious prescriptions. Substantive justice is therefore much more important to them than conflict justice. In this regard, the unilateral methodology seems more, much more compatible with their concerns. A glance at MENA legal systems confirms that, except for Tunisia and Lebanon, private international laws, law rules rely on a unilateral approach. Article 2 of the Moroccan Family Code provides, for instance, that um, the articles of this code apply uh, to all Moroccans, including those with another nationality. In other words, the Moroccan Code must apply to all relations involving a Moroccan person. Unilateralism is clearly adopted. The intention behind this attitude is obviously to preserve the scope of application of religious law in cross-border relationships. Therefore, one can understand why MENA countries are still reluctant to sign the Hague Conventions concerning family law. The fear of possible application of a foreign law which could ignore religious provisions, and moreover the fear of a secularization of family law coming from outside through international conventions, are probably at present the main hindrance to the signature of the Hague Conventions. She says, I don't want to leave, however, the impression that things are once and for all static. In the last decades, the landscape started to change and some evolutions occurred concerning the mean legal systems and the Hague Conventions themselves. On the Hague Conventions side, the breach with the traditional private international laws methodology and the rise of new methods based on the cooperation of authorities have allowed mean legal systems to reconsider their position towards the Hague Conference. This is because the cooperation of authorities in the field of family law often aims at achieving a substantive result, such as, for instance, the return of the child in the state of its habitual residence after a wrongful removal. Such an approach is certainly more compatible with the concerns of Arab countries, 
since it allows them to check whether the solution implied by the convention is in conformity with their religious values. On the MENA countries side, the signature of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989 has led to a better awareness of human rights in the field of family law. It's interesting to note that the reservations to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child have been less important than they were for the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. As a result, it seems that the universality of human protection of children is more acceptable than it is in the area of protection of women. This is probably due to the fact that in contrast with the fundamental rights of women, many fundamental rights of the child, such as the right of the child who is separated from one or both parents to maintain personal relationships and direct contact with both parents, Article 9 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, are often compatible with the requests of religious law. Moreover, fundamental rights of the child may have been the bridge between MENA legal systems and the Hague Convention. They have facilitated connections between both systems. It's therefore important to note that Tunisia and Morocco, which have made the most significant efforts in the Arab world to ensure the compliance of their family law with human rights, are the only two signatories of the Hague Conventions in the field of family law. Thus, there is obviously a strong link between domestic law and private international law, which is still particularly significant in the MENA countries. Wherever family law has evolved towards a better compliance with fundamental rights of children, the signature of Hague Conventions on private international law can be seriously considered. This does not necessarily suppose for these countries to breach with religious law, but to adapt it, to interpret, interpret it in accordance with the fundamental rights of children. Hence, it's not easy to make reliable forecasts regarding the evolution of family law in that region. No one can seriously challenge the fact that these countries are run by contrasting currents, conservative and reformist, traditional and progressive. Reforming family law remains a very sensitive issue, which is closely connected to political and sociological factors. At the same time, ignoring international conventions relating to family law can have a very neg negative impact on the protection of children of MENA countries, especially when they live abroad. This point may be further developed. I think you would agree with me that's a very interesting discussion and expose from, uh, from Lena uh, on what's happening in the MENA countries. Um, so perhaps um, uh, using <coughs> that last paper, uh, I might just ask the panel uh, this question, and Anne-Marie averted to it uh, a little earlier, about the multi-process, because uh, I think that feeds into what, um, what uh, Lena was saying in her paper about adoption of conventions. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I agree with Lena that in some ways a purposive convention such as the 1980 convention um, can, even with a fully compliant Sharia state, um, it can still be compliant and allow them to join the convention um, because it doesn't, it's not a custody and they're not asked to determine best interests in terms of who a child should live with. It's just, was the child wrongfully retained or removed? If so, return to that country so the court can deal with it. Um, and therefore, it shouldn't offend their public policy. I think probably, it was, and it was mentioned yesterday about, you know, we, we're talking about nation states, but other stakeholders, we need to consider the issue and the concept, possibly, by certain groups who would say that Islam isn't a state and it's, it's, it's so big that it, it's, it's, it, the, the religion cannot join as it, as it were a state party. And I think that is problematic for some states. But I don't know, in the audience, do we have people from um, states that apply the Sharia or have any observations? Certainly the ones from Pakistan, yes. Mm -hmm. Do you want to make a comment on... on no, no, okay. Thank you. 
Sharia law, the custody has to go after a certain age to the father. But at times it happens that the father is, has married and uh, he doesn't have financial resources like her mother. So even if the child crosses that age, we exercise discretion that the custody should be with the mother. So that kind of a liberty is there in, 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 in our country, in my country. The question at the time arises that when we ask the child, where do you want to live? Either with one parent, mother, or father. And at times he, he chooses one of the parents, but the financially good for his future will, is to live with the, other, with the other parent. What should be done in that situation? Because this is a family law, uh, international family law, child protection. So what should be done in that situation? This is, this is my, this is, the, this is something which is worrying me. Does anyone want to comment on that? Mm -hmm. mm. I mean, from a point of view of um, the convention, say the 1996 convention, um, the decision as to what should be done in that situation would depend whether Pakistan is making that decision or the other country for which the child is associated. Um, connected with is making that decision. Um, and certainly between the UK and Pakistan, we had the Pakistan Protocol, which allowed us mutually to return children in a bilateral way. And that works. That works. There are certain areas where it doesn't work, and they will, in Peshawar, they won't apply it, but certainly if it's from Lahore, they will apply, the High Court there applies the Convention and returns children. So because it, it, it doesn't have to deal with the issue of the custody. If it's sending a child back to the UK, it's for the UK judge to decide. Equally, if we're sending a child to Pakistan, that's for the Pakistan court to decide where, which parent this child or which part of the family the child should live with. Thank you. Um, there was discussion amongst the panel about uh, the importance of supporting the existing conventions. And I think some themes emerged from that, uh, access to justice, uh, especially legal aid. Uh, procedures which uh, are not lengthy and provide an impediment to access to justice, judicial training, training for, uh, for, for lawyers. Uh, it, it, is that working? Is there anything else that we can do to support the existing convention? Perhaps I should add that I think that something like the, the working group that I'm chairing on Article 13.1b, uh, which is seeking to at least have some, um, uh, try to get some consistency through a process which is ultimately uh, up to the discretion of the judge to apply an exception, but trying to, to provide best practice so that the, uh, those judges who are applying the exception at least know what they should be thinking about and how they should be approaching it. Um, they're some of the things that have been happening. Does any, what do the panel think about anything else that we might be doing? Anybody? Um, I will talk from the Latin American perspective, and as, well, as I was telling before, I think that uh, some of the conventions, especially the 1980s, has a great ratification status. And on the one hand, in, the, in, in, in a lot of countries, we have standards on the interpretation of the convention which are really appropriated, I think. I think also that uh, there are challenges to face, as I said, but I also think that despite the, the regulation on the, on the length of the procedures, there are also another issues that should be working on and that have work, been working on uh, nowadays, which are the mu mutual trust in cooperation. I mean, it is different when you are not part of the, of, of, of like for example, in the, the Europe countries as the UE. So, in, a, in, in Latin America, perhaps this fact of trusting the foreign judge, it is an issue that it is evolving, but it is still a work to do in this respect. Uh, I think that the INCADAT database is a great tool, which is 
uh, used often by judges to know how procedures go in another in another forums. Um, also, in some countries, there are problems as the, for example, the, the lack of dissemination of international convention. I, for example, I, I sometimes I use to do some this training for judges, and I have an auditory of 500 people or 400 people, and I say, does anybody knows a convention that deals with maintenance? And nobody raises their hands. So, for example, in Latin America, the, the Convention of New York for maintenance is really well known or used, but a lot of people doesn't know yet. So, there is a, a lot of work to do also uh, on that. Um, I, some countries didn't designate the central authorities yet. So, there are things to do. We are going forward, but there are still work to do in this regard, and that the, at least the, we have some some regulation in some countries. For example, uh, Uruguay has a great uh, procedural law that is really working well. They solve pr uh, proceedings in six weeks or, or less. And also Chile and, and a lot of countries of the region are working on this. So I think that we will improve, but there is still work to do. Mm -hmm. And I would think there is, there is a need to also address other professional groups, not only the judiciary. Mm because um, um, I think that the judiciary in certain countries, it's probably well informed, but I'm not so sure whether the um, um, other authorities that also deal with family issues, I'm thinking now, for example, migration officers, they, uh, we have in, 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 in Europe this uh, reunification uh, law, um, and they, I don't think that they even realize that they have a private international issue there sometimes when there is a marriage or there is a child, uh, an adoption or whatever. They, they, they will uh, not apply PIL reasoning, uh, which is because they are not properly trained. Or in, 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 in my own country, I would say that lawyers, family lawyers, if you think about commercial law, normally these international cases, they go to the bigger law firms so there, people know what they are doing. But in family law, it's very often very small uh, firms or very small uh, lawyers, uh, one person, one single lawyer. Um, if they are working on legal aid, I mean, you cannot be sure that this person is really, uh, the person that is giving the advice is really knowledgeable in private international law which is why I think that capacity building should go beyond the judiciary and perhaps something should be done uh, in order to reach out to other legal professions. As I said before, I think that synergy between academia, authorities, I mean, sometimes the compartments are very, very split and, and sometimes this interaction between them could uh, help in this task of migrations or in a central authorities, even though, or uh, also, for example, when, when a country is working on the ratification of a new convention, the advice of, I mean, in some countries this is obviously, but in others don't. So it, I think that this is a tool to take profit on. Uh, just going to ask you about Russia. I mean, I suppose that's a good example of a country where not only are they new to the convention, in a sense, but also they haven't been part of the mainstream legal systems of other countries in recent times. Um, yeah, I mean, the Russian Federation, I mean, it's quite fascinating because it's just so huge. And it, it, it was, so you could see the, the, this mindset change that has to happen. And that's going to take a long time. And Certainly under the 1980 convention, they've trained a significant amount of judges in, their, in the four areas. Um, and at first instance, they're making return orders. But not one of those return orders has survived an appeal to the higher court. Not one. So at, at the appellate level, then they would say, no, the child shouldn't return. It's a Russian child and it's a Russian mother. Da -da. So you know, it, it's going to be a long, a long haul, but it's a, it's a massive constitution of 1980 cases right around the world. There are so many Russian nationals living outside of Russian Federation with dual national children. So it's an, it's an important, whatever's going on, we must continue to support them. Okay. Um, yeah, someone have a question? Yes.
Testing, testing. Thank you. Uh, my name is Al Farhan from Saudi Arabia. It's for there's two elements here when you discussed, even though I came late, but uh, I can just give you a brief. According to my distinguished colleague from Pakistan, this is show you a very interesting uh, shifting in the system. When there is a huge number of cases, for example, Britain, Pakistan, Britain, India, then you're talking about millions of cases. So then the constitutional element gets involved. The both states have to come to a certain platform to solve this problem. That's why the, the state itself, for the interest of their own people or their own dual nationality citizen, they come to solution to satisfy both constitutional system. That's why in Pakistan, for example, there is a waiver of the sh sh Sharia perspectives. In the custody, yes, it's a matter of mutual uh, you know, understanding, agreement is done. But when it's come to inheritance, this is it's something no one can change it, except willingly, like the father or the mother agree before death, they sign or transfer property to certain kids because they fear that if they pass away, that the other brothers and sister might deprive them from their rights. So this is one solution that the father or the mother do it in advance. The second option is that in his will, he would write, I gave a gift to this person. Then he will receive his inheritance plus the gift from his father or his mother. This is number one. I really, for the part, uh, your right honorable uh, QC Diana, when you come to the part of HCCH, I strongly support uh, Professor Jogan Basdo yesterday argument is to have certain element inside HCCH. And when it's come to, to discuss certain issue about inheritance, custody, when it's come to Islamic State or Sharia law, that's to become an opt. That, for example, Saudi Arabia could enter negotiation and discuss all the elements. Then there is certain elements. They will say, look, you know what? This we will not, we can, we will not change it. We will opt it, but we'll comply with the rest of the rules and regulation and everything. Then it's become smooth. But it's impossible to come to a sovereign to say to sovereign state, oh, you must do this. Then they say, okay, I'm not interested anymore in this negotiation. They just leave the room and not interested anymore to even discuss it. So uh, yesterday, Professor Jogan, he really presented a very interesting uh, like a platform to make bring everyone together. And also, His Excellency uh, Secretary General uh, Christopher, also uh, bringing a very interesting uh, dialogue under the Malta discussion for this area. These kind of uh, windows, they encourage more state to come and sit and negotiate and participate, even to become uh, signatory to all these protocols. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think um, I think probably anyone who's had anything to do with it would agree that the Malta, the Malta conference is a, a really really important. Um, yes, one one more, then we'll t take some other questions. You see, the, in in Islamic Syria, there is that there is a rituals, the religious uh, performances. Then there is a, a way of life that has been prescribed. But in, there is also a room called ishtahad. So when in the way of life, if the society changes, if changes are to be made, required to be made, then the collective, collective wisdom of the society can change the, those laws. But at times, the state, the rulers, or the clergy don't allow that, has never practiced, exercised that right. So as far as the share in inheritance is concerned, that is the minimum that for protection of, a, of the family has been provided. But it can be varied through the will of the parents, but that can still be done in, in I think, in any Islamic society. But to, to make certain other changes, for that, suppose the, 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 the representatives of the people can sit together and make changes which, which, which are the requirements of the modern day society that is specifically allowed
But I don't think that in the past thousand years uh, this has been exercised by any Islamic society, a country. So that needs to be, that is, that need is there that with, the, with the world which makes, wants certain changes for the protection of the family, that changes can be brought about if the, the will is there. <coughs> I take out of that message uh, that we should keep talking and uh, to the uh, countries who are not signatories to the Convention I, and keep just, pursuing the Malta process. May I just add one thing? Um, I talked about uh, private autonomy and party autonomy and letting people, uh, trying to encourage people to reach agreements. And I think I'm not a specialist in Islamic law, but I think that there, there is a commonality, uh, something that we could build on because also under Islamic law, uh, the agreements that are reached within the family are uh, perfectly accepted and, and, and enforced. And, and that would, would connect with also an upcoming trend in, in, in Western societies to also uh, encourage people to enter into agreements and not impose a certain idea of what it should be. Okay. Um. I think that leads yes. us back into the discussion for the moment about um, uh, the, the unremarkable family and the need to, to support those who want to enter into private agreements. Um, how are we progressing with, uh, with the, uh, looking at cross-border agreements? How difficult is the task and, uh, for those who are on that committee and how are we progressing? Maybe I don't know whether you want to say something. Okay. Well. Um, uh, I think that we are still discussing desirability and feasibility, and uh, uh, there are mixed feelings, if I may, if I may so, say so. I mean, there are some people. I'm I'm a big fan of this project. I think it is a very important one. Why is it a very important one in my view? Because it is a project for all families. It's not a minority thing. Uh, we have focused uh, very much in family law on things that are very important, but only for a small number. Uh, whereas agreements uh, that is uh, interesting for everybody, it can be, um, it's cross-cultural. I think that if we focus on the commonalities, we, all our societies want to protect families because families are important and they fulfill an important function. And in all our societies, we want families to uh, manage their own affairs. Um, and that should be possible also in cross-border cases. And um, um, uh, what happens, uh, and this is something that we have seen and, and detected in the, in the expert group, is that um, family agreements are uh, very often package deals. They are not only about maintenance or not only about parental responsibility. They are cross, across everything, <laughs> including property, where we don't have a, a convention that is um, widely ratified. So uh, there would be some value in having uh, um, something that would help these agreements uh, to um, travel. Um, and um, um, in my view, um, it would be possible if the decision, the political decision, were taken to do it, because it's a technical thing. Uh, it is not, uh, there is no political discussion. Um, I'm, I'm also in the other group, which I'm, I like very much, and there are many people from the other group here. I like very much, but of course, parentage is very complicated, uh, because we, we are discussing it from, from the perspective of, um, you know, there are some people that are in favor, other people that are against. But nobody is against agreements. On the contrary, everybody is in favor of agreements. So why don't back them up and make them travel? It shouldn't be that difficult. I just wanted to add, I completely agree with Christina, and I just wanted to add that uh, the, from this starting point that agreements are usually the best solution for the kid and for the family for the children and for the family, because they continue being a family after this organization of family uh, is settled. And I, what I just wanted to add is that if, if you see the drafting of the 
soft uh, law instrument that we are developing, you will, uh, you will notice the complexity of this subject matter, and we were in this work, in this working group, facing this complexity and trying to do sim simpler something which is not. So from this, uh, from this instrument, from this drafting uh, tool, I think that you, you will notice these difficulties and the idea that's, that's, that analyzing the feasibility of a new instrument is to have something that complements what it is existing right now, no to uh, to go over them or to avoid them. It, it, I, what I mean is there are some blanks that these all instruments leave in which uh, perhaps putting an order and, and some rules will be profitable for this uh, circulation of these packaging agreements. <coughs> Well, it sort of comes out of that, and I, I uh, started with this point, and I think it comes back to this, what, what, what are we defining as a family? And I think, I think it should be possible to, because families, are, they're so disparate. Um, and there's a, a case, actually, that's going to the C, CJEU, and it arose out of a grandmother from Bulgaria who applied for access to her grandchildren in Greece. And the Bulgarian court um, said, well, the children are habitually resident in Greece. You must apply there under the regulation. And then the question arose, though, on appeal. Um, the Bulgarian question arose, does the regulation apply to grandparents? Or is it parental responsibility only parents? And that's the question that's going to the um, CJEU. But the advocate's general opinion on it, which he he's gave out last week, and is at using the 96 convention in its broad terms said it should be read broadly and it should apply to wider kinship members the regulation just as the 96 convention does so i do think we should look at that and as you say just because after a divorce the family still exists it's just a separated family um and in other societies the extended family is part of the family um, certainly in Pakistan, the, you know, the in-laws are part of the, that's the family. It's not just the nuclear family. I think it's really important that we look at those issues. Um, and any conventions are wide enough to incorporate the widest term of what is a family. And I think lastly I'd say, I have never heard a child, and I represented a significant amount of children in my career, refer to half people. You know, you never hear a child refer to their half brother or their half sister. It's a brother or a sister. They do not understand half people. Thank you. All right. um, I'm going to throw things right. open now to, to the Can audience. Can I ask a question? Uh, just, just, yes, sorry, you've had your hand up for a while. Yes, over Can here. I? Then, I'll, then I'll take that one. Can I? Um, I'm from Russia, from St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm very interested in, uh, in uh, your comments about uh, my country. And uh, there is a practical question. Um, uh, the courts of uh, my country are divided upon the principle six of the Child Rights uh, Declaration of UN, uh, 1959, which says that uh, child is inseparable, should not be separated from the mother, unless some uh, extra extraordinary something. So the uh, some courts in Russia interpret this principle as a principle of international law, general principle. Some do not. Some courage, uh, uh, some some judges take the courage to rule in favor of uh, order to, uh, to order the return, but the appellation and the, and the Supreme Court says we can't go beyond the UN. What what, you, what UN told us said is said the UN said that uh, this is the principle. Uh, we should not separate the child from the mother if, even if the mother is an abductor. So this kind of. Um, discrepancy or um, uh, reveals a kind of uh, something to be done and to be explained, especially as yesterday somebody here already raised uh, the question of the, what is general principle of private international law? Should that, shouldn't they be uh, formulated under the agenda of the Hague Convention? Thank you. Can I just quickly say on that point, um, unfortunately for Russia, Four cases have been admitted to the ECHR on that very point um, in non-return cases. So I think we will have those decisions coming out of um, the European Court of Human Rights 
in the next six months. And it will be interesting how they deal with that issue. Is the, U, the UN Convention predominant, or is it the 1980 Convention? And, and how do I, I mean, just thinking, listening to that, how does that fit with the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child that says the child's got the right to know and be cared for by both, both of their parents? Um, so uh, it seems to me to be an interesting question for the court. Um, over there? Yes. Thank you, Professor. My name is Niju. I come from Wuhan University. Um, and I noticed that HCCH we can't hear. Uh, doesn't work. Thank you. And I noticed HCCH is working on the international circuit agreement. And I think it's a very interesting and uh, important topic to work on. Um, recently, I was working on this problem too. And I found some interesting yes. questions. That we can't, we can't hear at the moment. Can, can, have you got a louder? OK. I find an interesting case in China, happened in China I want to share. And uh, this, is, this is a confusing problem. Mm. In China, a young couple took out their sperm and egg and had invert and had uh, the IVO, IVF operation and kept the embryo in the hospital, hoped to have their baby through assistant reproductive technology. But unluckily, they died in a car accident a few days later. Mm. Whatever, finally, the court decided to give the um, ownership, to, um, ownership of the embryo to the father and mother and father mother in law of the dead couple. Uh, and, and the poor old man then decided to have the, uh, decided to find a, a surrogate Sorry. mother in Laos um, and give birth to the child. Uh, and the child was born four four years later than the than their parents died. <laughs> this is interesting. Mm, but my question is, do you think the do you think the grand the four grandparents have the right to um, to do the surrogate job to give the birth to uh, to give the birth to the baby? This is my first question. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Okay. I don't know that one. <laughs> um, uh, what I should say, I don't know. I don't know so far uh, China's legislation as well, but what I should say is that this is reality. So realities impose this subject matter as an important matter to deal from the private international law perspective. <coughs> And I think that because of this case and a lot of cases, not like this, but with each peculiarity, is the subject matter is in the agenda of the Hague Conference. And just as you bring out the point, just to remark that the project of the, of the conference is regarding parentage and, of course, that it includes the uh, International Surrogacy Agreement. So if we think on parentage, we have to consider that everybody has uh, legal parents or should have legal parents. So this is a problem or an issue that is important for all the community, not only for these people who uh, who, who take the who needs to 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 use or to utilize uh, uh, to, to use these kind of techniques, but uh, it is an an important thing that everybody in this globalized world could travel and. To, to, con to have a continuity of the parentage taken in, in one place. And of course, the, the International Surrogacy Agreement, it is an important issue on parentage, but as a whole problem. Yeah, if, I'm, if I'm, I may add, in, in this project too, we are still at the feasibility and desirability. Uh, and, and, and of course, the difficulty is that a question like the one that you are posing is nearly an ethical or, or, or a substantive law issue. It's not a purely private international law issue. And there will be different views um, in different countries. Uh, but to continue on what Nieve has just said, um, I think that uh, you have two possibilities when you are confronted to something like surrogacy, either to refuse to deal with it 
because you don't want to get into trouble with the politicians at home. Um, but then it's going to continue. You are not going to be able to stop it, uh, which is not accepted. In my country, there was an ethical committee that decided that they, would, they recommended a worldwide prohibition, which was absurd because it's not mm -hmm. going to go that way. Or the other possibility that you have is you deal with it, and then you try to perhaps introduce certain standards, minimum standards that should be respected. <laughs> and there we would have to discuss issues like this one. Because I think that one ethical for me, but I'm, I'm, I'm not an ethical expert, but uh, for me one of the issues is this age gap. I think that sometimes it is problematic mm -hmm. uh, that you have a, a baby and both parents are you know, 60 years older or 70 years older than the baby, um, because what will happen to the baby later on? But then this is a subject matter that would have to be discussed. Yeah, I think uh, I, I agree with Nieve. It's, um, we may have laws that stop you from, from doing that and engaging in surrogacy, and we do, we do in Australia, um, but people don't comply with them. And uh, the reality is that people will do what they want in this area, I think, and we can't stop it. So I agree we have to look at how we're going to deal with the children and the aftermath of it, if you like, because we, we, we've got to confront the reality it's going to happen. Um, um, Marie, did you have a question? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Marie Riendou from Canada. I just want to shortly intervene because I'm also a participant in the experts group on parentage and we have to be clear that the experts group or the work of the Hague conference is not to promote or not to promote surrogacy. We're dealing with the reality of children and their status and the recognition of their status and some of these children happen to be born as a result of a surrogacy arrangement but we're not promoting the practice through this work. We're just dealing as you uh, just noted, Diana, we're dealing with children who are born and we have to deal with their parentage. So it's not a group to promote or not to promote surrogacy. It has to be uh, clear in that sense. Um, thank you. Any other? Yes, down here. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I have a question than... for uh, Anne Marie. Um, I'm a solicitor working in Hong Kong, involved in family and committee work protecting the mentally incapacitated persons. So I, I would like to know what do you think can be done to push for this international convention to protect the mentally incapacitated persons as well as, you know, they, they call it ch behaviorally challenged elderly. <laughs> because I can also foresee that in the coming years there will be more and more of these cases and even abduction cases um, for these dementia patients overseas. In fact, it's been happening. So I'd like to see what we can do to push for this. I think actually probably Christoph should answer that because I think that, you know, I, I agree with you and you only have to look at our society. And, and it's good, these cases are going to increase and then issues of when people move overseas to retire, you know, the English they buy their house in the south of France or in Spain and then they become incapacitated and they're in a different, you know, the, and their carers, their families are in, you know, in the home country. And what's going to happen? So I think it's it really. I, I'd like to know what the, what the conference is doing to promote the convention, to you know move it forward, given this change in demographics, Christoph. <laughs> Hong Kong does up. not have a court of protection. Huh? Yes. So so you know it's it's very interesting, and I think this is something that probably we need to really push for as well. Right, one last question, and then we'll have to break morning tea. Yes, down here. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. I would like to go a little bit further in terms of challenges. And of course, I'm meaning challenges as the commissioner said yesterday as opportunities and look further in the future. Uh, Miss Anne-Marie, when, when you started, you mentioned about the concept of family 
and Ms. Gonzalez extended the concept to what we mean as family. Uh, of course, when we are discussing about uh, family matters, and especially child abduction, we, are, we have to uh, think of the results of the crisis, and obviously we are talking about tragedies, and the background of this is the uh, best interest of the child. Uh, Honorable uh, Diane Brandt uh, worked on a very uh, important uh, guide we discussed on the last commission, but still I believe we have further questions to address. And I would like to hear your thoughts about points such as access, protection, and uh, uh, things related to the family, and especially to the mothers. Things that we see today and will be challenges for the future. We have cases of the abduction when the mothers do not have protection, they do not have visa, visa to go to the country. How do we deal with this important point? Are we just returning the child as a challenge, as a uh, best interest, but what else? What can we do further than this? Thank you very much. Um, I, I might just try to answer that briefly if I can, and, and, then, and then say uh, come to the breakout group <laughs> tomorrow and we can discuss some of these issues um, in more detail. Um, I think that is what you raise as one of the essential uh, challenges of the abduction convention. You know, it, it is an old convention now and social mores have changed and we know it particularly in relation to the grave risk of harm, which of course is what the working group's about. Uh, the profile of the, the people who wrongfully remove their children we now know to be different from that which was thought when, the, when it was being drafted. Um, uh, protective uh, measures for women and children, we know a lot more about family violence and all of these things have to that the convention has to, as I think Anne Marie said, be a, a living and evolving convention. Uh, so they're the things that we have to grapple with. Um, we're trying to do that with the guide to good practice. Of course, one of the, 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 the one of the benefits and one of the problems of, of the convention is that in the end, it's a judicial process about the exercise of discretion based on uh, the convention and the exceptions about whether to return a child so, and, and ensure that children are not put at risk. So that's that's what we are trying to do with the, with the guide, but I think as you, you would know, if you're at the Special Commission, it's a, it's a difficult task, but one that we have to, we have to grapple with. Um, but please come along to the breakout group and uh, let's talk more about some practical things about how we can do that. Okay. So let me um, thank you for your participation and please, again I say, if anyone's interested, come to the breakout group tomorrow where we'll be discussing uh, what we can do for the future. And would you please, Think with me the uh, the three panelists who you've had this morning. <laughs> we have morning tea. Yes, thank you very much to all of you for uh, this thought-provoking exchange. Indeed, um, that you provided this morning with all the careful consideration and sensitivity that family law and child protection matters, in particular, compel and require. Now we're going to work a little bit on the sound issues. I apologize for that. Um, there's some technical issues, but that's not the only one. If I could remind you when you make your interventions to hold up your microphones as close as possible to your mouth. Um, the microphones have a very small, I think it's called a sweet spot, and if you want to be picked up properly, um, that's, the, that's the trick. But please join us now for the coffee break where we, we don't need microphones. Um, just downstairs, um, I understand everything is served, and we will reconvene for session three at now 11.20, so we have our half-hour break, which I think we well deserved, and we return to uh, international commercial and finance law, which is, as we heard just before, intricately intertwined with family law. Thank you.